God doesn't just want something from you. He wants what's best for you. Today, we get to talk about, specifically in the passage we're studying, it talks about and says, for this is God's will for your life. If you've been wondering what it is, this is it. (laughs) And in doing so, what we find is actually the key to contentment. The secret to finding contentment is not by going after contentment. It's by going after God and then finding that in him you have absolutely everything you need. Isn't this good news, church? Isn't this good news? I know, I know. If you say it the second time, you get way more excited. I wonder what happens if I said it the third. Nah. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians, turn with me. Chapter 5 is where we find God's will for our lives. And it says this, Paul writing to a church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. Rejoice when, church? How are we doing so far? Always means, yeah, you got it. Good job. How are we doing with this one? Let's keep going. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And as you discover this, contentment is the byproduct. But have you noticed Contentment is challenging because circumstances and people are challenging. (laughs) You discovered this. It's not just that they're challenging, it's that they're difficult and their difficulties affect us, right? I mean, I'm driving down the freeway, someone zooms past me, that's their problem, but the problem is when they cut in front of you and then they slow down. (sighs) You wanna know what God's will for you in that moment is? Rejoice always. Yeah. Pray continually. Give thanks. <laughs> what? The week I began studying this, I'm driving on the freeway. A stray piece of wood comes out of nowhere, scratches the entire hood of my car, smashes into the windshield, and throws up. You want to know what God's will was for me that day? Rejoice always. Pray continually and give thanks. <laughs> so, I, so I began studying it on a Friday. Saturday morning, I wake up <clears throat> to all these notifications to my phone. Like, are you trying to spend $1,000 at CVS? Are you doing all this online shopping right now? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm obviously not doing it. <gasps> my car was broken in two. My wallet was stolen. You want to know what God's will for me was that morning? The day after I began studying it, later on the week, I get an email from an older woman from my church, and I looked up like this email, we've emailed back and forth before, and it says, hey, uh, my my credit cards aren't working on Amazon, and it's my friend's birthday, I wanted to send her a birthday gift card from Amazon from me, so if you could send her that, I'll pay you back, and here's the note I'd like it to send with my email address, that'd be great. I said, sure. How much do you want to send for? She's like, $250. I was like, whoa, you're a good friend. We're friends, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So I did. I sent off the $250 and immediately got an email like, thank you so much. I'm actually, it turns out it's actually not enough. Could you send another $400? <gasps> I fell for the internet scam that I literally warned my parents about. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for your life. Okay. What do you do when life's not fair? How do we live this? How do we find rest for our souls when life is not fair? How do these two things come together? How in the world, right? Here's what I've discovered in studying this passage. The way that it's possible is actually the key is found at the very end of the verse. We'll get there. But it's basically in addressing that same statement, life's not fair. Because typically when we say the phrase life's not fair, here's what we mean. I deserve a good, easier life. <laughs> I deserve kids that are obedient. Spouses that are servants. <laughs> Jobs that are fulfilling. Bosses who are generous. A salary that's higher. Strangers to be kind 
And friends, if that's what we expect, then you're going to be disappointed a whole heck of a lot. If you look at life and expect for it to be, we, we, we critique the younger generation, right? They're so entitled, but the truth is, so are we. See, if we expect life to be here, and then you look at everything, and then the windshield moment happens, and I literally call insurance, and I'm like, the stray piece of wood. You know what she categorized it as? The random stray piece of wood on the freeway? An act of God. I'm like, don't blame him, lady. <laughs> but the truth was, I expect to drive and nothing to happen. I expect things to go well. I expect people to stay alive. I expect cancer not to exist. I expect my health to be great. And friends, if we expect this, then we're gonna be disappointed a whole heck of a lot. And life is not fair. And the truth of that statement is not found in when we mean it like that. Because the truth is, life is actually not fair. And there's a second way of looking at it. And that's when we look at what we actually deserve. And if it's true, if the Bible is true, that the wages, the earnings of our sin, of missing the standard of perfection is death, then it means this, that we deserve to be very far from a holy God. We deserve not to be in the relationships with the people that we've hurt the most. We actually deserve nothing. Life's not fair. And friends, my hope and prayer is that by the end of this message, God could do a work on your soul to see it's all been grace all along. So we'll start at the beginning. Point number one, rejoice always. Why? Because life is not fair. I always giggle when the credit card commercial comes on and says, get what you deserve. I think, nah, I don't really want that. <laughs> Why? You go all the way back to the beginning. In fact, in Genesis chapter two, we learn about our anthropology. And here's what we find, Genesis chapter two, it says this in verse seven, then the Lord God formed a man from the, here it is, here's where we begin, the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living thing. We are from the dust, we are from the ground, and then what we know is that after this moment, so we're created, you got day one, two, three, four, five, six, day six, man is created, day seven, God rests, and then we listen to another voice, right? And that's page three, Genesis chapter three begins in a different way, and then there's all these consequences, if you will, for the sin, and look what it reads, and suddenly, it's not just that we're from the dust, after the fall, look at this, chapter three, verse 19, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you, here it is, return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you, ta you shall return. And every time it uses the word ground here in those first two, ch three chapters of the Bible, the ground is from the Latin word, we get the word hamas, which is the same word we use when we get to the word humility. And the reason I bring up our anthropology is this, this is where we're from. And because of the wages of our sin, this is what we deserve. And if we even follow the path of Jesus, you'll see that he took a very humble route. I had heard for years, yes, even in his incarnation and God coming to earth and becoming man, it was so humble, right? Do you remember? Literally born in, born in a feeding trough for animals. So humble, so low. And what does he choose to do? He actually gets lower. The next picture we have is him as like a young kid. And what's he doing? He's in the temples. God with skin on is asking questions. So humble. And he just goes lower and lower and lower and obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, lower and lower and lower. And if we're following the path of our Savior, then we need to do this to recognize here's where we're from and here's what we deserve. And friends, here's what I've come to realize. The lower you get, the more potential there is for you to look up and see everything's a gift. And it shifts your perspective on everything. For instance, let's say one of you has a surgery coming up. There's two ways of looking at that. God, how did the cancer come back? Life's not fair. Second way, I deserve nothing, and you're telling me there's a doctor that has a plan? It's all grace. And the question is how you're looking at it and what we think we deserve. The only way Paul can look at this church and say rejoice is because he knows what he deserves. Do you? And I say that with this invitation to recognize when you think you deserve nothing, it's possible to look up and suddenly everything becomes a gift. The people sitting around you become gifts. In fact, you even begin to see 
The wages of my sin is death. I, de I deserve to be very far. I don't even deserve the breath that I have. And God has put all these reminders, even in our bodies, like our heart that beats 100,000 times a day. It's like this constant reminder going like this. Gift. life we have, it's not fair. <laughs> Enjoy it. It's all a gift anyways. Enjoy it, church. Enjoy it. I have a friend <coughs> who he and I were talking about this, the, like, the path of Jesus, the like, how shocking is it to, to go this way when the whole culture is trying to get you to go this way? This way is so competitive. This way makes you entitled. This way makes you think that I deserve to be at the top. Friends, what happens when you go the opposite direction? You look a lot more like Jesus. And it's so profound. My friend says, you know what I do sometimes? I just enjoy the gift of existing and not having to prove my worth. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I take a lawn chair, sit in my front yard, and I just sit there and I exist. <laughs> I was like, that is so weird. <laughs> He's like, my kids walk over, like, what you doing, dad? He's like, I'm existing. And I'm enjoying that I have nothing to prove. I'm like, wow. I was like, why do you think people don't do that? Why don't we enjoy life? Why do we think that we deserve all these things? Like, what, what is it? And this is what he said. He goes, I think the reason we don't sit and enjoy the fact that we can just exist is this. He says, I think we're trying to justify our existence. Friends, rejoice. You have nothing to prove <laughs> to anyone. And he's given you everything you need in him. So rejoice always. Now I have to give you a key in this rejoicing piece. Rejoicing within it is that word joy. And the first time I started studying this, I thought that rejoice always meant be happy. <laughs> but here's what I've come to find. Thanks be to God. Joy and sadness can coexist. In fact, well-meaning Christians sometimes suppress the dark anguish of things like grief because we think, no, 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 joy means that, that grief doesn't exist. No, no. It's almost as if we tend to believe that we're suddenly sad and then suddenly we graduate to joy and that's the goal. No, God teaches throughout scripture that we can have joy and within joy talk to God about the painful delay of peace that he promises. And in communicating what's precisely in the heart, that's incredibly important because we have the hope of the future. We have joy in the midst of the pain, but that doesn't mean we ignore the pain. That actually means we move on to part two of this, of this section. Not only do we rejoice always, number two, we pray continually. And how do we pray? We pray honestly. Because joy and sadness can coexist. We can actually grieve to God because we have joy. We have hope that this is not all that there is. And so we can cry out to a God honestly and say, how long? Because we have joy that this will is not as because we have joy that this worth is this earth is not it. So we can cry out how long and still have joy because we know that this pain we're going through will not be for forever. Do you know this church? In fact, the pain, sorrow, and grief we have to endure here is temporary for Christians. And friends, joy is permanent. <laughs> and the opposite of joy is not sadness. Joy, sad, hope, grief, love, and anger can all coexist. The opposite of love, you've heard, is not anger, right? It's apathy. It's not caring. Because if, if you love someone, you actually get angry all the time because of anything that's limiting them and their full potential, right? Anger makes a lot of sense. Similarly, the opposite of joy is not sadness, because, but the Bible shows that they can both coexist. The opposite of joy is not sadness. You ready for it? The opposite of joy is hopelessness. We have hope. We can rejoice. We can rejoice because we have the freedom to feel all of it in the meantime with a God who cares about all of it. I talked about creation. Day one, two, three, four, five. Day six, he creates us. Day seven, God takes the day off of work to hang out with us. He wants you to pray continually because he wants relationship with you in all of it. 
And I mean all of it. Why is it that we just trust him for salvation, but the relational drama we feel like we have to take care of by ourselves? It's almost like we do this performance prayer. Maybe it's just me, but I don't think that it is. Where you do the performance, dear God, I'm just so thankful and thine is the glory and pick forever and I love you. And I'm so sorry. And then what happens? Your mind begins to wander. Anyone else have this experience? And then what do you do? You pause your prayer and shame yourself back to the performance prayer. I'm so sorry about that. I don't know what that, I don't know what that was all about. I'm just... Okay, so I love you, and I'm just so grateful for all that you've, and then what happens again? Can I tell you something? A wandering mind is a gift in prayer. Because where does your mind wander to? Jesus puts it this way. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where's your mind wandering to? The very thing that has your heart. Guess what Jesus wants to talk to you about? That. (laughs) No matter what that is. Can I tell you what I do every morning? I push my coffee button, which is like a trigger in my brain to do this type of prayer. I present myself to the Lord, and then I go through this whole, like, I am not primarily all these different titles that I hold. I'm primarily in you. I'm primarily in you. And then I let my mind wander, and we talk about that. It's so profound. I'll tell you where my my mind wanders to. It wanders to my bank account, and oftentimes it also wanders to my calendar. It's almost like I go into prayer kind of feeling like a little bit out of control, and I'm like, I'm going to let it go to the things I think I can control. And God's like, I want to talk to you about that. And I'll tell you this, wherever your mind wanders, God cares about all of it. That's why he's wooing you to pray continually. It's not about a performance prayer because the performance prayer doesn't suddenly make you, make you worthy of his attention. He loves you in your good and in your bad. He loves you in your good thoughts and in your bad thoughts, and he wants to be with you in both of them. Pray continually. He's wooing you out of isolation or trying to fix others or trying to fix yourself all by yourself in the weakness of the power of your flesh. How's it been going? He's going, no, no, no. Pray continually. Even if the very thing that's coming to your brain is, I don't even want to spend, I'm kind of bored with the Bible. Be honest. Here's why. I can only imagine God when you go, I'm kind of bored. He's like, Now we're talking, because that's in your heart, and you don't have to feel that alone. Do you hear how wild this is? It's probably been the most significant thing about my prayer life in the past two years has been considering that God wants all of me. And it's kind of a reflection to me, and it reminds me that sometimes I don't treat my kids this way. I mean, sometimes I, I mean, if you were to ask my kids, do I love them more, and they're good or they're bad, I think they'd say, All of it the same, just kidding. I haven't prepared them for that question, but one day I will. (laughs) But honestly, if you were to ask them probably today without me preparing them, I think they'd go, oh, she loves more when I'm good. Friends, he loves you when you're good and he loves you when you're bad. And if you simply open up the bad and you receive the love there, you'll come to realize his love for you has never been dependent upon you. Isn't that good news? See, we use all this language, I just need to get closer to God, I just, need to, I just need to pray more, as if it's up to us. Friends, if you've given your life over to Jesus and the spirit of God lives within you, he's not getting any closer based on your behavior. In fact, he wants to be with you and it's his presence that transforms your behavior. It's his presence that transforms you as you open it all. As you take absolutely anything, let your mind wander in you. Let him meet you there. Pray continually. Rejoice because the relationship is available to you and he doesn't stop there. He ends like this when he says, give thanks in all circumstances. You know what I'm really thankful for? That it doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. Some people, I hear them say thank you for crazy things and praise be to God that he's put that in their life, but... I don't think I'm at a point where I can say thank you for hard things, some of the hard things I've gone through. But I can tell you this, I can be grateful not to be alone in them. And the key to this passage, the the key to getting this life perspective switch happens right after he says, give thanks in all circumstances. And here it is. For this is God's will for you, here's how. In Christ Jesus. It is hard for us to be thankful or grateful in all circumstances if we're focusing more on what we must do instead of what has already been done, which allows us to stand different in his presence in Christ. So here's the truth. 
The reason we can give thanks is because we don't need to do anything in order to obtain the favor that we have from him. And this is so key. You already have favor if you are in Christ Jesus. See, here's the truth. The power and the beauty of the gospel is this. God knew that you would not be able to get to him. He humbly comes to us, lives the perfect life we couldn't and haven't, and dies the death we deserve rises to give us life in him. And in Romans, it says that if you, com- if you proclaim with your mouth, Jesus, you are Lord, which by the way, that is a direct contrast to proclaiming, I'm Lord. <laughs> that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from your sin and its consequences. Now, mind you, there are earthly consequences for our bad behavior. I don't want to negate that, but I do want to tell you this. When you stand, your identity, when you stand before a holy God, you will either stand there alone trying to tell him why you deserve to be there in heaven with him for all of eternity, or you will stand in Christ. And what it means to stand in Christ is to believe that he came to you when you least deserved it. Friends, if you think that because of your bad behavior or your apathy toward God or your apathy toward prayer or you're just not having an open heart or you're just trying your best, you're just exhausted, you're kind of over this whole thing, no matter what, if you believe that his pursuit of you was completely dependent upon you, you've missed it. Or if you think that he's going a different direction, that's bad theology because theologically God is moving toward us when we least deserve it, that's grace. He moves toward us, lives the life we couldn't, dies the death we deserve, so that if we put our faith and trust in his finished work on the cross, here's the truth about you. When you stand before a holy God, he doesn't see your sin, he sees his son. You cannot and have not out-sinned the cross. This is good. you can be fully forgiven in him. And as if that, and I, I understood that for a majority of my life. I missed the second half. I knew that Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross for my sins. It's like I memorized that phrase. <laughs> he died on the cross for my sins. Here's what I missed. On the third day, when he rose, he proved, number one, he is God. Number two, he has the power to make anything that's dead alive. Jesus is God and he can make dead things Alive, And he proved that he's more powerful than death. He's more powerful than its consequences. He's more powerful than all of it. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he took that which you deserve. He went to the cross and he died. He took and experienced that which you deserve so that you would never have to endure life without God ever. And that's not just for all of eternity. That's also here and now with all of your life and all the circumstances that you're going through. Thanks be to God, you're not alone in any of it. You're not alone in your mistakes. You're not alone in your failures yet again. You're not alone in your anger. Some of you are just going, I, just, I listen to church and it says to put off anger, so I'm just gonna try to put off anger and you're doing it all by yourself and you just don't have to. He wants to look at all of you with him and if you only open up your anger all of your life, he's saying pray continually because when you do, you'll see that I'm present with you there and there might even be some things that you're really angry about and I think if you open it to him, you'll find that he's angry about it too. And his anger is perfect and holy and it might even begin to transform yours. Now that's not the case for all of you. Some of you just have anger issues and he wants to deal with those, so. (laughs) But if he went to the cross for you, it means you get to stand, your identity in him, you get to stand fully forgiven. But it didn't stop there. Everything that's true of him, when we stand in him, becomes true of us. That, by the way, is how we can be referred to as a child of God. Not everyone's a child of God. It's those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, that Jesus took that which they deserve, and then by grace, they receive everything that he deserved. So that one day, when you do, I was looking at my notes a year ago, I shared this with you, but it just continues to blow my mind, so here we go. One day, you're gonna stand before a holy God. And the book of Hebrews blows me away because in the middle of it, the author goes, you know that throne? First of all, let me describe it. It's a throne of grace. Do you know this about the throne? 
See, it's hard for me to even get that visual because when I think of throne, God on the throne, which is where he's at, ruling and reigning, I imagine Revelation chapter four, Isaiah chapter six, I imagine him up on the throne. He has like the ruby face and he's like controlling the lightning and there's all these elders and all these eyes, I'm not quite sure, creatures, things, and everyone's going, holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And they're like, one more time, they're like, how about a million? How about for forever? Holy, holy, holy. And they're like, hymn of heaven, where's Phil? And everyone's going forever and ever. Holy, holy, and it's the epic scene and you are walking up to that and the author of Hebrews says that this is how you're going to approach it if you are in Christ Jesus. Whoo! Confident. What? How? Here's how. Because you're not walking up there with your resume of good behavior. You're walking up with a resume of Christ's finished work on the cross. You're in him, he's in you. And when you plead the blood of a substitute, I believe in Jesus. Well done. This is good news. We can rejoice in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Because no matter what's happening, he's going to use absolutely all of it. And as we endure all of it, which by the way, when we get to heaven one day, we're going to know Jesus like we've never known it before. But if it's true that there's going to be no pain, no more crying, no more death, no more none of it, then the pain that we endure here and now can only be experienced how? That's the only aspect of Jesus we can only know on earth. So endure. And while you do, don't lose your joy because although, it's, although sorrow is here, it's temporary we have reason to rejoice. It's not gonna be for forever. We can pray continually because he wants to do all of it with us. And lastly, we can give thanks because this is God's will. How? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you are more than enough ladies. <laughs> you're not only fully forgiven, you're also fully accepted already as you are. Can you imagine if that's gonna be our future in heaven, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Why not live like it's true today? Because it is. And as we go through life, we don't have to hide a thing from the God who made a way for us to have a relationship when we didn't deserve it. We might just allow everything to make us and take us lower and lower and lower that we might look up and see absolutely everything as a gift. But I also didn't wanna just tell you and hope that you agree with the sermon. I wanted to tell you about my real life and studying this passage. Because like I said, it was Friday that I began studying it and it was Saturday that my car was broken into. <laughs> I sat down on my couch and I'm like, rejoice <laughs> always. Okay, God, what? Tell me, tell me, please help me here. And I just opened up. And here's the truth I opened up my anger. I was really angry. So I sat there. And the streams of tears just kind of started coming down my face because I was just mad and sad at the same time. My little boy looks at me, he's like, Mom, you okay? We're watching Saturday morning cartoons. I'm like, I'm okay, bud. And he's like, what happened? What's going on? I'm like, someone broke into our car, buddy, last night, and they took my wallet. They took our money? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all of it? <laughs> I was like, no. We'll be okay. I mean, it's really inconvenient. I had a lot of cash, but it's okay. Actually, we're going to be okay. He's like, you sure? I'm like, Yeah. And then you know what came into my brain was that it was two people, because I could see it on some cameras, that it was two people. And I look at my son, I'm like, hey, your friends really matter. He's like, what? I'm like, never mind. <laughs> and he goes and starts watching the cartoons. And I just sat there and I opened it up. I'm like, all right, rejoice always. Thank you, God, that I'm okay. It's okay. And I said, what else do you want to teach me? I just opened it up. And I'll tell you, this is the lingering part that most people in the faith don't do. Because sometimes we want to get through our quiet time and then we're done, right? As if like it's not a real relationship where we really show up. We really bring our emotions. I brought my emotion. I'm like, I'm still kind of mad. I'm mad for a lot of reasons. And I was like, God, what do you want to bring to mind? What is it? And what he brought to mind was um, my sophomore year of college when I got arrested for stealing. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really want to talk about that. Let's go back to those bad guys. <laughs> And God kept bringing it to mind. He's like, remember? I just forgot. My friends got into stealing at like department stores. 
And they did it all the time. And one day they invited me. I said no a bunch of times. And then one day I showed up and went with them. And that was the day that when we were walking out, one of the sensors wasn't taken off and the alarm goes off and they all take off running and I just stop there and have an asthma attack. <laughs> Caught. And then they literally take me to a jail. And then we tried to get a hold of my parents and we couldn't because they were on a bike ride and then they didn't go on a bike ride for five years after that. <laughs> Finally, we get a hold of them and I have to tell my parents... I don't know what you're thinking as you're doing this. I mean, like, I was like kind of the perfect Christian kid that never really made bad choices. And this was shocking. I know some of you are like, that was it. But it was. It was like devastating to me. And like, my parents are about to show up. They're going to come. And they did, like six hours later. And they knocked on the door at, at the front. They worked it all out. And then they opened up the doors. And I remember walking out so ashamed. And I have a feeling I'm not the only one that's really ashamed of something that you've done. But I, rem I can remember a little, like, 18 year old version of myself, like, trembling. And I remember looking up. And my, mo my sweet mom's like this. <gasps> I'm like, Mom, I don't deserve that. And she like, couldn't wait to hug me. Mamas, our response, and they're good and they're bad, is significant. And I like hug my mom. And I'm like, Mom, I really don't deserve this. And my dad, so he's like, my girl, <laughs> you never did. I'm like, Dad, ugh, okay. <laughs> but actually, that was the truth I needed to hear, because up until that point, I kind of thought, like, Grace, I deserved it. Because I compared myself to a lot of other people, and I'm at least I'm not that bad. So like a relationship with God, like you're welcome. Like that's how I was. I was so prideful and arrogant. I didn't even see my need for the cross until my mom showed it to me. And I remember my parents had all the people they had ever met write letters to the court on my behalf. <laughs> that this was outside of my character. And I stand in front of a judge and he literally goes, so I got a lot of letters. <laughs> and he goes, I'm gonna do something with you I've never done before. And I knew that was either really good or something else. <laughs> And he goes, your sentence from the court is to speak publicly at every single local high school on decision-making. Friends, I am a speaker today because I got caught that day. That's why I'm here. You have not gone too far for the God of the universe to use you. In fact, he might just want to use that very weakness. Turns out it's in your weakness that his strength shows off. In your strength, that's as good as it gets. <laughs> in your weakness, he's like, watch this. And so I'm like literally sitting on the couch and he's reciting all of this. So now I'm like, I begin praying for the people that broke into my car that God would catch them, not so I'd get my wallet back, but that they'd actually know the power of grace. And now I'm, pr now I'm praying for these guys. <laughs> and then I continue to open it up and I'm like, God, okay, what else was taken? This is gonna be really inconvenient. I'm just sitting in there. And you know what God brought to mind, which is one more really big bummer. And because in my wallet, I had this card, which is from, um, it had my husband, my late husband who passed two years ago. Um, it had a card that I would use to buy things for my boys from their dad. And it couldn't be replaced. I couldn't like go to the credit card and ask for another one of these. And now I'm like, God, I'm so mad about that. He's like, you don't have to be alone in the mad. So I just was mad. Some of you are really mad and you've been just trying to stuff it and it's just spurting out on the people you love. It's time to bring that to the Lord who wants to transition it and he will in his time. And so I walk outside because I knew I was kind of like fuming in that moment. I'm just walking outside and I'm looking at the mess that was made and I'm walking around and I'm walking around. I'm just like, God, I'm mad, but I love that you care about all of it. And that's when I looked down and I noticed that somehow in the midst of all of it, they had thrown out the card. And here's the wild thing. It just felt like tangible grace. It wasn't like I'm giving you the story of like, and then what I deserved was this. No, it was just grace because turns out church, all of it is. The fact that God uses our weakness, grace. That he like shows up with like, and cares about a card, grace. But also cared about my anger and he was with me in it, grace. Heartbeat, grace. Relationships, grace. It's all grace, friends. Life is not fair. Praise God we don't get what we deserve. Amen? See, here's the deal, friends. In order for us to rejoice always, we do have to pray continually, and we have to give thanks. It might be a discipline for us, but here's what we'll find. In Christ, you have everything you need. And the byproduct, content. So bring your life to him, but don't focus on trying to fix this by yourself. Turn your eyes on Jesus, and as the old hymn goes, look full in his wonderful face. And here's what you'll find. The things of earth, they're just gonna grow strangely dim 
in the light of his glory and grace, grace being unmerited, AKA unearned favor. <laughs> That's what we have in Christ, favor. So I wanna sing this hymn, not cause I'm just some surprisingly good singer, that would be nice, not the case. I felt like it was actually gonna be an act of obedience and I hope it is for you too. We're gonna sing the hymn, just two choruses. Because I don't want you to get to the end of the service and go, oh, I liked it, or I agree with it. I want you to actually experience what happens when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, realizing you are in him and he's in you. And if not, that's the conversation that needs to be had today. What's keeping you from putting your full faith and trust in Jesus, not on yourself? He's made a way for you to have absolutely everything you need, and giving you reason to rejoice amidst the pain a relationship that will endure through all of eternity and a reason to give thanks no matter what. Turn toward him. Let's sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for wonderful face and watch what happens and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace if you're up for it on any campus in the room, stand to your feet as we sing this final chorus together. I recommend closing your eyes and do your best because anxiety is kind of dominating your imagination these days. Let's give it back to Jesus and see what happens as we turn our eyes. Let's sing one more time. Here we go. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light. God for unmerited, unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor and the life we have that is not fair. Thank you for giving us reason to rejoice, to open up all of our emotions and our life circumstances to do it with you, God, to be honest. Because God, prayer is not a place to be good. It's a place to be honest. Teach us to be honest as we pray continually and as we remember the gift of your presence, may we give thanks in all circumstances, God. Thank you that this is your will for us in Christ Jesus. And we give thanks in all God's children said in unison, amen.